Welcome to Excess Returns, where we focus on what works over the long term in the markets. Join us as we talk about the strategies and tactics that can help you become a better long-term investor. It's Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at Validia Capital Management. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital. Hi guys, this is Justin. In this episode of Excess Returns, Jack and I talk with Duran Nassim, Ernest & Young Professor of Accounting and Finance at Columbia Business School. We talked to Duran about earnings quality, from why earnings quality is more important now more than ever, to how to measure it, to what it tells you about a company, to the financial and non-financial levers that can impact earnings. Duran shared his earnings quality presentation with us, so there are slides that complement his thoughts and insights spread throughout this discussion. So it might be best to watch it on YouTube on the Excess Returns channel if you can. As always, thank you for listening. Please enjoy this discussion with Columbia's Duran Nassim. Hi, Duran. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Today's discussion is going to be all about the quality of earnings, which is something that you've spent a considerable amount of time researching and studying and thinking about and actually teaching um, students for a number of years. Uh, there's a lot work we're going to discuss. There's a lot to discuss. There's a lot of, I think, important and interesting topics when it comes to earnings quality. Um, in preparation for uh, this discussion, you sent us your main presentation on earnings quality. And I think it's something like, I don't know, maybe between 40 and 50 pages. We're not going to be able to get into all those details today. Uh, we'll be a little bit higher level, but I think it, this is going to be a really good subject for our audience and for the types of investors that follow our podcast. So, so really, thank you for for taking the time to to join us. I wanted to start just with you: is how, what led you to focus on earnings quality? As you know, analysts, portfolio managers, other market participants use and rely on accounting information all the time. Still, many of them don't really understand this information or know how to evaluate its quality. Much of my research, teaching, and consulting over the last 30 years has been about improving users' ability to understand and use accounting information. How would you define what earnings quality actually is then? So the accounting literature provides alternative definitions of earnings quality. These definitions are related, but they're not identical. High-quality earnings are sustainable, free of error and manipulation, informative, accurately measure value creation, or conservative. So basically, five different dimensions. But out of these five dimensions, the first one, earnings being sustainable, is the one that most practitioners and academic research focus on. Sustainable means that the earnings that companies report today, we can expect to see them again in the future. They are generated from core operations. They exclude one-time items. They reflect good matching of expenses against revenue in the income statement. And they are measured in a consistent way year after year. Now, the primary reason that practitioners and academics emphasize the sustainability view of earnings quality is that this is the one that is most consistent with valuation. So if you think about how we do valuation, it's either relative valuation or fundamental valuation, DCF. Relative valuation, we basically apply a multiple to an earnings construct. So if earnings that companies report are sustainable, they are a good indication for what we can expect in the future. So when you apply a multiple to earnings today, you get a good indication of value. And if you think about DCF, when we conduct DCF, we need to predict revenue, we need to predict profit margin, and several other components. But revenue and profit margins are the primary one. And when earnings are sustainable, the profit margin that we see today is a good indication for what we can expect in the future. So again, it makes the task of estimating the value of the company more, more easily done. How would you characterize the current landscape of the market in terms of earnings quality? The earnings that investors are being reported, I mean, are they, are they good quality earnings or how would you address that? So I'm actually con have concerns about this for several reasons. So one reason is that over the last three decades, the FASB, which is the body that sets accounting principles in the US and the International Accounting Standard Body, both of them have been increasingly setting standards that emphasize the measurement of assets and liabilities on the balance sheet over the reporting of sustainable profits in the income statement. So several examples 
include the fact that we increasingly emphasize measuring investments and other assets and sometimes liabilities at fair value. Fair value can fluctuate a lot. And when that fluctuation is reflected in the income statement, you have a lot of volatility in the income statement. And the earnings that we observe today are not a good indication of what we can expect in the future. We also have much more impairment tests these days than we used to have in the past. Most assets are subject to some form of impairment test or another. And when we recognize impairment, we are introducing volatility into the income statement. We also have the asset liability approach for measuring income taxes. Again, another element that adds volatility to the income statement. So these standards, you know, makes the income statement, the earnings that we report in the income statement, more volatile and therefore less indication of what we can expect in the future. But that's not the only issue that we have, the, not the only reason for the deterioration in earnings sustainability. Not less important is the fact that over the last 30 years, but more so more recently, we have more and more uh, intangible intensity. So if in the past it was primarily about property, plant, and equipment and tangible assets, now companies increasingly, the most important resources are intangible assets. And we also know that there is more economic uncertainty, more economic volatility, again, especially in recent years. These trends make earnings more volatile and therefore less sustainable. But it's not just volatility. Related to the point of more intangible intensity, Intangibles introduce distortion into the financial statements. We know that when companies invest organically in intangibles like research and development, like hiring, like training, like investments in information technology, in the brand, advertising, all these organic investments that for many companies are the most important investments, we are required to expense them immediately. We don't report an asset on the balance sheet, we expense them. And this creates distortions. For example, think about a pharmaceutical company or any company that does a lot of research and development. If you cut research and development now, earnings will go up because there will be less expense in the income statement. But what will happen to earnings in the future? They will be lower because there is less investment in these important resources. So the fact that we expense investments in intangible assets and the fact that intangible intensity has been going up makes earnings, these two facts make earnings much less indicative of what we can expect in the future. In fact, research suggests that much of the failure of value strategies in recent years is due to these effects. So, so looking at the, at the issue of earnings quality, um, why would I, like for, for an investor who's investing in a company, why would they be concerned about high quality earnings? Why, why would that be really important to somebody buying a company? So you want a valuable company. A valuable company is one that has earnings power. Earnings power means that the earnings that we see today, we can expect to see them in the future too. They are sustainable. So by definition, and again, the way that we define earnings quality is primarily earnings being sustainable. By definition, the higher the quality of the earnings, the more sustainable the high, the higher the earnings power of the company, and therefore, the higher its value. But that's not the only reason. You know, another element of earnings quality is that if earnings are of high quality, they are less likely to have been manipulated. And we know that manipulation can be very costly to investors because if earnings are manipulated, we may have restatement later on, there may be SEC enforcement action, there may be litigation, there may be other events that lead to multiple contraction and a big decline in value. So if we have high quality earnings, we are less concerned about these potential bad events in the future. And you know, even if earnings manipulation is not going to be detected, it's still costly. Because if a company is overstating earnings now, earnings growth in the future is going to be lower. It's going to be lower for two reasons. One reason is that by overstating earnings today, the base from which we measure growth in the future is going to be higher. So that mechanically means that there will be less growth in the future. But also, we know that over the long run, earnings, the difference between earnings and cash flow is about timing. In the long run, earnings and cash flows are the same. So if you're overstating earnings today, this means that you are 
understating earnings in the future. So for these two reasons, for earnings, uh, for the earnings base being higher, and for the fact that more earnings now mean less earnings in the future, if a company has low quality earnings because they are overstating their earnings, and you don't understand this, you're going to find yourself with a negative surprise in the future and negative stock returns. Just as an aside, when you talk about the field of earnings quality, does that sort of encompass all the financial statements? So, you know, obviously there could be issues in quality and balance sheets and everywhere else. I mean, it seems like in your presentation, you're dealing with all of that. So does earnings quality kind of encompass all of that? Yes. So basically, when we talk about earnings quality, what we really talk about is not just the end of the income statement, the earnings at the end of the income statement. We also talk about other aspects. Like, for example, think about a company that has a one-time gain and reports it as revenue. Earnings are not affected, but this is low earnings quality. Why? Because people see more revenue, they think that this is recurring, and it's not really recurring, you know. So this is also viewed part of earnings quality. But also to your point, the balance sheet too. In fact, when we think about earnings quality, one of the best indicators of earnings quality is what we have on the balance sheet. Why? Because when you have a lot of assets on the balance sheet, assets that we have today are future expenses. Think about property, plant, and equipment. It's future depreciation. Intangibles, it's future amortization. Inventory is future cost of goods sold. Prepaid expenses are future expenses. Most assets that we have on the balance sheet are going to be an expense in the future. So one of the best indicators of earnings quality is to compare the assets that we have on the balance sheet with revenue. If assets are relatively large compared to revenue, especially if assets are growing faster than revenue, it's a big red flag because additions to assets on the balance sheet will have to be expensed in the future. If assets are growing and sales is not growing at the same rate, it means that in the future we're going to have losses because for the, the level of sales, we're going to have more expenses because the assets that we have today will have to be expensed. So many times when we think about earnings quality, we think about what the balance sheet tells us about earnings quality. We think about footnote disclosures, so it's much more comprehensive. It's interesting. It's almost like a circular process where if there's a quality issue on one financial statement, it's going to end up on all the other financial statements, basically. It's, it's unavoidable. Exactly. And this is exactly why profitability analysis is so important. Because profitability analysis, what it does, it compares numbers from the income statement with numbers from the balance sheet. And this comparison many times tells you a lot about earnings quality. Another example is what we get from the cash flow statement. The cash flow statement, most companies, the way that they prepare it, and by most I mean more than 95%, they use what is called the indirect approach for presenting cash from operations. The indirect approach is you start with net income. You actually start with a number that you have at the end of the income statement. You start with net income, and then you reconcile net income to get cash from operations. So the view here is the following. Net income from the income statement is a measure of performance based on a cool accounting. Cash from operation is also a measure of performance based on cash accounting. So in the cash flow statement, we are comparing accrual earnings with cash earnings. And this comparison and the, and, the, and the adjustments that we need to make to go from net income to cash from operations are very informative about earnings quality because they are telling us our net income that we have in the income statement, our what are the reasons for this net income to be different from cash from operations? And these different reasons tell us a lot about whether the earnings are sustainable or not. So many times when we evaluate earnings quality, we do it not by focusing on the income statement. We do it by comparing amounts from the income statement with amounts from the balance sheet, with amounts from the cash flow statement. And all three financial statements are important when we evaluate earnings quality. But actually, it doesn't even end there because there is a lot of additional information in the notes to the financial statements, in the MDNA, uh, the, and, and in other events, in non financial events that we're going to talk about later on. And all of this information has to be brought in together to get a view about earnings quality. You listed in the presentation some reasons why earnings quality is even more important today than it has been in the past. And you've already talked about intangibles, but I want to go through some of the other ones. Uh, one is low rates. Why, why do low rates make earnings quality more important? So, you know, over the last three or four decades, so like something like 35 years now, we have interest rates going down. 
Now, it's true that over the last year, interest rates went up, but this was primarily nominal interest rates, not real interest rates. Real interest rates are still very low compared to levels that we had in the past. So we have this negative trend in real interest rates. And, you know, we talk about duration when we talk about bonds. But, you know, the same concept of duration is also relevant for equities. You invest in this stock because you expect to see some cash flows in the future. If most of the cash flows are going to come in the near future, the value of the stock is primarily affected by what will, what will be the cash flows or the earnings in the next few years. But if much of the cash flows are going to come in the far future, and if interest rates are low, so the present value of these future earnings is relatively high, then what determines the value of the stock today is not just earnings or cash flows in the next few years. It's really in the long run. So when interest rates are very low, the duration of the stocks, the duration of equities effectively lengthens. And this means that it becomes increasingly important to know that the earnings that we observe today, we're going to also have them not just in the next few years, but in the long run. So when interest rates are very low, it's very important to identify or to be able to evaluate how sustainable are the earnings, not just for the near term, for the long run. The other factor you cited is the increased use of quality factors. Um, why does that make earnings quality more important now? Yeah, because if you look at the quality factors that people out there you know, use, they are very arbitrary. They are, they are basically derived from the data. So people look for different ways of constructing variables from the data that appear to best explain stock returns. Now, if, if things were consistent, so if what works now is also going to work in the future, then that's probably fine. But we know that we live in a very dynamic world. Things change all the time. So what used to work in the past may not work in the future. So if the only way that you derive quality factors is by just letting the data speak for themselves, you know, you're probably not getting a very robust uh, predictor or estimate of the quality of the earnings. Also, uh, you know, you want to have a good theory and a good understanding of how numbers are related to each other because economic relationship, accounting relationship, financial relationship give you additional uh, information that you're not necessarily collecting from the data themselves. So having a more structured way of building uh, quality factors, one that has, is based on a good understanding of the accounting and other relevant information may give you significant improvement when it comes to incorporating quality factors. You had a great slide in the presentation called uh, What Determines Earnings Quality? And in there, you list some of the major factors that, that drive earnings quality. Can, can you talk about what some of those are? Yes. So historically, we always thought about earnings quality and earnings management. So if the company is managing or manipulating earnings, earnings are of low quality. And if they don't manipulate earnings, earnings are of high quality. So for example, much of the research, early research in accounting, focus on this aspect of earnings quality. But that's not the only relevant aspect of earnings quality. More recent research says, you know, you, if we think about earnings quality as earnings being sustainable, then whether earnings are sustainable or not is not just a function of whether the company or management manipulates the financial statements or not. It also depends on the business model, on the decision that management makes, and on factors that don't really depend, uh, they're not out of the control of management. So for example, if you have a business model or if you make decisions that gives you a balance sheet or assets that are mostly uh, capital assets, so if you have a capital intensive business, if you have lo long operating cycle, these are characteristics that make uh, the sustainability of the earnings potentially uh, more problematic. For example, you know, if you have a lot of property, plant, and equipment, we need to estimate depreciation, use for life, salvage value, inventory. We need to estimate whether we need to write it down, similarly for receivables. So, so when we have this type of assets, that there is much more potential for error or manipulation. Also, the distortion of historical cost accounting. If you have more property, plant, and equipment, the distortion from historical cost accounting are going to be more significant. So these are also relevant factors that tell us something about whether the earnings are sustainable or not. And if you think about factors that are out of the firm's control completely, the industry that you operate in or what is going on with the economy, 
So for example, think about uh, cyclical companies versus defensive companies. Defensive companies earnings tend to be more sustainable throughout the cycle. Cyclical companies, if we are at the top of the cycle, earnings are not sustainable. So it's relevant to know what type of industry the company operates in when we evaluate the sustainability of the earnings. And even at the macro level, you know, if the economy now is uh, at the peak of the cycle, earnings are not sustainable for almost all companies. So if you want to really evaluate the sustainability of the earnings, you don't stop with just evaluating whether earnings have been managed or not. You also look at these additional aspects. And research tells us that, that these aspects are not less important than whether earnings have been managed or not. And maybe I will just add another component on this. Historically, when we talked about earnings management, we used to focus on manipulating accrual estimates. So the company doesn't recognize enough bad debt or enough warranty or enough expected sales return or the manipulate depreciation. So this is manipulating estimates that we need to come up with to measure earnings. So this is traditionally how we thought about earnings management. But since Albin Soxley, we also think about more so than we did in the past about real earnings management activities. So what am I talking about here? Think about companies that want to increase earnings and they want to do it in a legitimate way. What would be a legitimate way to increase earnings? Not R&D. You're not manipulating. You're making a decision that is a real decision, but it still allows you to, to increase earnings. And there are many other examples of real earnings management activities that companies engage in to manipulate earnings. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of people, when they probably think about earnings quality, you probably think about, you know, you reference like fraud. They probably think about things like that. But so much of this is not that. You know, so much of this is things that can be done that are perfectly legal, you know, that maybe can have the earnings today not represent what the earnings might, not, might look like in the future. Exactly. Exactly. And, and th- th- we have a lot of research on real earnings management activities. Uh, the one that I just mentioned, like, for example, cutting R&D or, or engaging in other activities like selling, uh, selling assets that have a fair value which is above their book value. So by selling them, you realize again. So there is a lot of research that, that shows that it's from the perspective of managers, it's less risky, you know, because I'm not going to go to jail for cutting R&D. But if I manipulate the financial statements and I'm the CFO or the CEO and I have to sign on the financial statements, it may, may have negative consequences for me. You referenced some of the indicators already, but, you know, sort of the next step after identifying earnings quality is like, what are the indicators we can measure to, tr- to try to look at it. And you broke them down into financial and non-financial indicators. And I'm wondering if just at a high level, if you can kind of talk about what those are and maybe underneath them, what some of the other uh, subcategories are. Yep. So one way of, you know, we have many, many indicators, many factors that we can consider when we try to evaluate earnings quality. And one way of trying to distinguish or among the different factors is, as you mentioned, to think about those factors that we measure using information from the financial statements versus factors that uh, are measured using other information, non-financial information, or more correctly, uh, information not from the financial statements because it can still be financial information. Okay, within the financial indicators, we, we, we think about comprehensive indicators, and then we have line item indicators. Examples of comprehensive indicators will be to take earnings and break them down, break them down into the cash from operations, which is the cash component of earnings, and accruals, which is the non-cash component. Now, we have a lot of research in accounting and finance that shows that on average, the cash component of earnings is more sustainable. So if a bigger percentage of the earnings is in the form of cash earnings, that suggests that earnings are more likely to be sustainable. So this is an example of a comprehensive indicator in the sense that it looks at total earnings, and, and try to say something about whether they're sustainable or not based on this, uh, you know, this analysis. Another example would simply be to just look at the volatility of the earnings over time or to look at the level of profitability because the level of profitability itself, and by profitability, I mean earnings relative to the investment. That also tells you something about whether the earnings are sustainable or not. So these are examples of comprehensive indicators of earnings quality and much of the research in academia, but also in practice, focuses on comprehensive indicators. And then there are the line item indicators. The line item indicators, we look at specific line items from the financial statements and try to evaluate their qualities. So for example, when it comes to evaluating the quality of reported revenue, 
we tend to focus on days sales outstanding. So basically, it's the ratio of uh, receivables to sales per day. So it's an estimate of how many days of credit we extend our customers or how long it takes us to collect the receivables from the customers once we sold the product. That tends to, to say something about the quality of revenue. Or we can look at days inventory held, which tells us something about whether cost of goods sold is, is, is understated or overstated. We look at the rate of depreciation and amortization, which tells us something about whether the reported cost of operating capacity is, is reasonable or not. So we can come up with specific indicators for specific line items from the income statement and more generally from the financial statements. So these are the indicators that we derive using information from the financial statements. But we have a lot of research in accounting and finance and in, in, academic, in practice too. And this is increasingly implemented. For example, if you think about ratings of ESG, the G component in the ESG is primarily about non-financial indicators that tells us a lot about the sustainability of the earnings and the quality of the earnings, the risk of fraud, for example, which is another component of earnings quality. So we can look at non-financial indicators, as I mentioned, where are the governance structure. Is it strong, weak? Uh, we can look at the situation that management is facing right now. So for example, if earnings are going to be slightly below important benchmark, like consensus analyst forecast, this will make it more likely that managers will try to uh, manipulate the earnings. So these are just two examples of uh, non-financial indicators that tell us something about the likelihood that earnings are sustainable or not. And I touched on other ones like the, with the economy or the industry that you belong to, uh, or, or events that happen. If there is a restatement, then clearly it's an indication of earnings quality issues, change in, change in auditor, change in key executive. So there are many events, circumstances that may tell us quite a lot about the likelihood that earnings are manipulated or whether earnings are sustainable or not. Yeah, we, we run value models and there's always debates in the value community about, you know, do you use one indicator like EV to EBITDA or do you use like a composite of all the value indicators? And it seems like with earnings quality, this is a situation where composites are probably appropriate. I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like in order to get at this, you really need composites of a lot of different things. Exactly, exactly. And not only that you need to look at the composite, you need to do it in a contextual way, something that we're going to talk more about. So one of the interesting things you had in the presentation is, you know, a lot of people will go to Yahoo Finance and they'll see the PE ratio and they'll just sort of take it at face value. You know, this, this company trades at this time's earnings. But, you know, it was really, you know, it was really eye-opening to me looking at this and looking at all the different things that, could go into that, that PE ratio, maybe not giving me the true picture of what's going on. So I was wondering as an example, if maybe you could, and you use some other, uh, you do had EV to EBITDA in the presentation as well, but I'm wondering if maybe you could use the PE ratio and just give us some examples of, of how that PE ratio we're seeing on Yahoo Finance may not give us the true picture. So it's a good point. So when we talk about PE, the question is how E is measured. If E that we are talking about is the reported earnings per share versus the forecasted earnings per share. I'm focusing on the situation where we compare it to reported numbers, not to the forecast. Okay. So if you think about reported earnings per share, we know that companies, for example, just by buying back shares, can increase their earnings per share. And it will make, and it will have an, an effect, you know. So if you're looking at companies and you, you want to invest based on PE, for example, just use your simple PE, price to earnings per share as your value indicator. And you find a company with low PE ratio, so you say, I'm going to invest in it because, you know, it, it appears to be a value company. But what if they have low PE ratio simply because they bought back shares and this way they increased earnings per share. When you buy back shares, you're effectively increasing your leverage. You're making yourself more risky. So this is not an indication of, of mispricing. So one issue with PE, one issue with PE is that it's impacted by leverage, impacted by share repurchases. If you compare it to EV to EBITDA, it's not sensitive to it. If you buy back shares, or if you change your leverage, it's generally not going to have a major effect on your EV to EBITDA. So if you think about which value ratio do I want to use, PE or EV to EBITDA, if your concern is about differences in leverage in the universe of companies that you are ranking, then you probably want to shift to EV to EBITDA and not PE. Another issue with PE, earnings per share is at the bottom of the income statement. It includes everything that you have in the income statement. 
including transitory items like restructure or volatile at least, like restructuring, impairment, gains, losses. So this makes earnings not a very good indication of value. You know, for earnings to be a good indication of value, they have to be sustainable. They have to represent the earnings power of the company. So if you have two companies uh, that have the same earnings, uh, but the, the price should be the same because if the earnings are a good measure of sustainable earnings, the price should be the same. And if it's not, then maybe it's an opportunity to identify mispriced stocks. But if the earnings for one company include transitory items and for the other they don't, then you lose the ability to differentiate or identify mispricing based on the P-E ratio. So that's another issue. Again, less important with when you use EV to EBITDA because EBITDA tends to, to exclude transitory items. Many transitory items are reported outside of EBITDA. So that's another dimension that will push you toward using EV to EBITDA and not PE. And finally, you know, depreciation and amortization is a very problematic call. Companies can manipulate depreciation. Uh, we, we have the issue of the historical cost accounting. When you bought the assets, impact how much depreciation you're going to have, especially now that inflation is going up again. So this distortion again uh, starts to be uh, more important than it used to be. But it's much more than that because it's also affected by when you have M&A, when you have uh, mergers and acquisitions, how you allocate the price of the business that you acquired impacts the depreciation and amortization a lot. And that's another area where companies have a lot of discretion. And in the presentation, I talk about many other issues with depreciation and amortization. And for all these reasons, people say, okay, so we want to work with EV to EBITDA, not with PE, for these three reasons. The leverage, transitory items, and the depreciation and amortization, which, are, which is particularly problematic uh, expense accrual. EV to EBITDA does not have these three issues. But you know what? EV to EBITDA has many other issues that you have to take into account. For example, you know, if you look at EV to EBITDA, now when you compare companies, you have to worry about companies having different uh, fixed asset intensity. Because if you have two companies that operate in the same business, one of them has invested a lot in fixed assets, and the other one has a model that emphasizes labor. Not fixed assets, but labor. EBITDA reflects the cost of labor. EBITDA does not reflect the cost of fixed asset. So now the two companies with the same EBITDA in the same business should have very different enterprise value. Because for one of them, EBITDA reflects most of the cost. For the other, it doesn't. That's not an issue with, with PE because E reflects all the cost. It doesn't ex exclude the cost of fixed assets. Also, EBITDA is before tax. So if you have companies facing a different tax rate, EBITDA is not comparable. But earnings per share is after tax. EBITDA is measured with error. The amount of depreciation and amortization that we take from the cash flow statement, because that's how we measure EBITDA, is not exactly the depreciation and amortization that we have in the income statement. Some of it is in inventory. That's a relatively complicated accounting issue, but one that is relevant if you're using EBITDA. Other issues with EBITDA is that, you know, a very common abuse is that companies, they have an expense, they have an expenditure, they need to expense it, but instead they capitalize it, they book it as an asset. Now with EBIT or with earnings, this will eventually be in the income statement. Because if you report an asset, you will have to expense it. You have to depreciate it. But with EBITDA, the expense is not going to affect EBITDA because the depreciation is outside of EBITDA. So this very common form of manipulation, when companies capitalize costs that should have been expensed, is affecting EBITDA in a permanent way, but earnings only in a, in a way that reverses. And then there are many other issues with EBITDA, including, for example, the recent accounting change that we had with leasing. If now, if you're using EV to EBITDA, you have to be very careful about operating leases. You have to make adjustments for them. In the presentation I describe how, you probably don't have the time to get into it. But the key point is that earnings quality is not just about measuring quality factors. Earnings quality is everything. Whenever you use accounting information, you have to think about the accounting and you have to think about all the implications that come with it. And I think that this PE versus EV to EBITDA and the issues that you need to be aware of is, is a good example because the people that you are talking to are primarily uh, value investors and people that care a lot about these things. As you were talking about the issues with each one of the indicators, I, I was wondering, like, when you, if you use a value composite, are you making this any better? 
Like, are you basically, since each one has their own issues, if you bring them together, are they sort of offsetting each other a little bit? Or do those issues remain and you're really not making the situation any better? Well, many of these issues you can address. You know, you can do something about them. So, for example, if you're using PE, maybe you want to use an adjusted turn exposure, one that excludes or at least smooth out volatile items. If you use EBITDA, maybe you want to, maybe you want to, wait to, to identify a universe of companies that have fixed similar uh, capital intensity. There, there are things you can do. Yes, and by averaging, averaging the information that you get from the different value metrics, you're getting another, uh, another important element. I would add to it the following too, and which is also the reason why people increasingly look at quality factors. You know, PE can vary across companies because of the quality of earnings. So you want to combine quality factors into the analysis too. You want to essentially condition the value ratio on everything that affects it. And if you condition the value ratio on everything that affects it, and you find yourself with a residual that is either positive or negative, you want to essentially invest based on that residual not based on the P ratio itself. That makes sense. You, you touched on this a little bit earlier, but this, this idea of contextual analysis you had in the presentation. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just maybe define that and talk about how important that is for earnings quality. Yeah, so I think it's extremely important because it gives you a lot of additional insight. If you think about red flags, and, and you touched on it earlier on, you know, any red flag that you can come up with, so you can have someone that tells you, you know, I came up with the best indicator of earnings quality. It's a great red flag. There will always be an alternative explanation. Any red flag that you come up with, there is always an alternative explanation. You can never have high level of confidence from one indicator of whether you're really getting good insight about the quality of earnings. So what you want to do is you want to bring a lot of different indicators together. And importantly, you want to do it in a contextual way. And I think the best way to explain it is using example. The most common abuse, according to the SEC, the most common abuse of manipulating uh, financial statements is channel stuff. What is channel stuffing? Channel stuffing means you ship more merchandise that you, sh you should to the distributors, to the dealer down the channel. So how do you do that? You convince them to take more, more merchandise now instead of waiting until the next quarter. Are they going to agree to do that? Well, maybe, maybe if you give them a, if you extend credit, if you give them a discount, if you allow them to return merchandise in case they didn't sell it. So they may agree to go along. So the way we typically evaluate whether a company engaged in channel staffing is to see whether we see more credit on the balance sheet. So how do we do it? We compare receivables, how much we owe the customers, which for the company are the dealers to which they sell, how much, how much credit we extend to them. And if we extended too much credit, it's an indication that maybe the company engaged in channel staffing. But maybe receivable went up for a different reason. Maybe there was a change in the type of business. Uh, maybe we moved from uh, selling to retail, we, move, we moved to selling to wholesale. There could be a lot of alternative explanations. So just the fact that day sales outstanding goes up is not necessarily an indication of manipulation. But what if day sales outstanding is going up, the gross margin is going down, suggesting that we are giving our customers discount. What if reading the financial statements, I see that there, there are a lot of returns. There are a lot of write-downs of inventory that was returned to the company. There is write-downs of receivable. The company is engaging in selling receivables to hide the fact that receivables are building up. What if I see that distributors that are also public companies, I look at their financial statements and I see that their level of inventory is going up. What if I look at the company's earnings and I see that they are just above uh, the analyst consensus forecast? What if I know that this company has a weak governance structure? If I bring all these pieces together, then suddenly I have much better confidence of my ability to, to identify the likelihood or to estimate the likelihood of channel staffing. So this is what I mean by contextual analysis. You, look, you, you don't look at all the ratios. Look, you look at the ratios that are more relevant to the specific uh, concern that you have. But you also consider other, other relevant information that may inform on the likelihood that, that that item was manipulated. Yeah, it seems like a lot of it is, is about asking, you know, you see something that's a red flag and then asking more in-depth questions about why that could be. You know, there's some good reasons for it, maybe some bad reasons, and, you know, trying to identify which one it is in this case. Exactly. Um, just one more for me before I hand it back to Justin. You, you 
uh, alluded to this idea of profitability analysis earlier um, in, in the discussion. And I just want to dig into that a little bit more because that's a big part of your presentation. Can you talk about why profitability analysis is still important for earnings quality? Yep, definitely. So in the presentation, I included a slide that shows how you can start with return on equity and decompose return on equity into the different drivers. So return on equity, you basically compare net income to equity. So in the denominator, you have the equity investment as reflected on the balance sheet, the investment by shareholders as reflected on the balance sheet. And in the numerator, you have the net income that was generated. So return on equity is essentially a measure of how well the company did for shareholders. But then you want to say, okay, if a company gave me return on, return on equity of 20%, and there is another company that also gave me a return on equity of 20%, but for one of them, that profitability was coming from co-operations. For the other one, it was due to a one-time gain. Is it something relevant to know? Obviously, yes. We want to see that earnings are sustainable. Because when we do this type of analysis, we, we don't really care about the past. We care about the future. The, the, the reason we are doing it is to try to, to get some sense for what we have in the financial statements that is likely to repeat itself in the future. So the first component that I do in the profitability analysis is to take the return on equity and divide it into the portion that we can expect to see again in the future versus the effect of transitory items. Now, that's not easy to do because some items may sound transitory, but they're not really transitory. If you think about restructuring, companies do restructuring from time to time. So it's true that in non-gap non disclosures, Companies will tell you ignore restructuring, but if you really want to evaluate the profitability of the business, you don't want to ignore it. You want to look at how much restructuring charge we have this year, and is it in line with what we see on average in the past? If it's more than what we saw in the past, then yes, a component of it is, is, is transitory. If it's less, it's actually transitory in the other direction. So identifying what is transitory in the income statement and what is not is not trivial, but it's a, a critical component of profitability analysis and it's one that is directly related to whether the earnings are sustainable or not. Okay. So when you decompose return on equity into the recurring portion and the transitory portion, in the process, you already say quite a lot about earnings quality, the sustainability of the earnings. But profitability analysis gives you many additional insights about earnings quality. For example, now you take this recurring ROE and you break it into the portion that comes from operations and the impact of financial leverage. Now, we know that when you have financial leverage, it's going to allow you to be more profitable at a shareholder's level on average. Why? Because you take on more risk. You take on more risk, it makes your earnings more volatile. So the more of the recurring ROE that comes from leverage, the more, the more volatility we have, the more risk we have, the less sustainable are the earnings. So financial risk translates into earnings sustainability. The more financial risk we have, the less earnings sustainability. But also in the operations, you can take the return that we generate in operations and break it down into no part margin. What was the margin? How much of each dollar of sales ended up as a profit? Your ability to generate sales using the investment in operating assets, turnover, is another driver of operating profitability. And yet there is a third one. Because if you have two companies, they have the same operating assets, they have the same margin, the same turnover, the same margin, but one of them is able to get a lot of operating credit, not financial credit, operating credit from suppliers, from customers that pay in advance, from employees that don't get all their money now, from the government through the fair taxes. You can have a lot of operating credit that effectively reduces the amount of capital that has to be committed to the business. And if you have to commit less capital to the business, then the same level of profits gives you a higher level of profitability. Now, so these are the three drivers of operating profitability. There is research that shows that these three drivers have a very different level of, of sustainability. So if I can break down operating profitability into these three components, and I know that the three components have different level of sustainability, it's another insight about whether earnings are sustainable or not. And there are additional insights there, but I should probably stop here. There is more discussion of it in the presentation and much more discussion in the earnings quality monograph that. Uh, that the, the link to is available. So are there areas of the market, I'm thinking certain industries or sectors where earnings quality is higher or maybe even lower 
I mean, in your, when, when you look at these companies, you know, in the market, where do you tend to find high quality earnings? Yeah. Okay. So it's a great question. I would say it depends on what type of concerns you have. Like, for example, if you think about a company that is very intangible, intangible intensive company. So think about company that the major assets are the human capital, the brand name that they have, you know, the service company, for example, with human capital and information technology, but not that much fixed assets on the balance sheet, not a lot of inventory on the balance sheet. So this type of companies. So the balance sheet doesn't have a lot in it. So if you don't have a lot of fixed assets, if you don't have a lot of inventory, you're not concerned about manipulating depreciation or about manipulating write-downs of inventory. So these concerns are not there. But you are very much concerned about manipulation in the form of, of the following. If you're in this business, you need your most important resource is people. You hire more people. You have an expense because hiring costs are high. Training costs are high. If you hire a lot of people now, it will depress your earnings, but will help your earnings in the future if these people are going to generate more profits for you in the future. So if, if you're looking at this type of business, the earnings quality concern that you have, that you're most concerned with, is what happens to the investment in intangible assets. If they, if they, if they cut this investment, it means that earnings are overstated, earnings are not sustainable. So that will be the major issue that you will look at. In contrast, if you look at a more traditional economy company, you know, where it's a lot about fixed assets, inventory, and so on, you will worry about these assets. So I wouldn't make it, I wouldn't uh, say it in the sense of like companies that you're worried more about earnings quality or not. If you're worried about manipulation in the sense of actually not doing what you, you're not reporting what you're supposed to report, then the old economy is probably more, more of an issue, like, you know, PP&E, inventory, and so on. If you worry about uh, cutting discretionary spending, the new economy, you know, investment in intangibles is what you would be concerned about. So my answer is, uh, unexploited issues, issues are everywhere, but they vary from one industry to another, one setting to another. Okay, that, yeah, that makes sense. It kind of plays into the next one. I want to ask you, let's say you had 20 firms reporting earnings. Of those 20 firms, on a scale of one to 10, how many of them would, with the 10 being the highest in terms of earnings quality, how many of them would be at a 10? I mean, are we having to adjust earnings quality for almost every company out there? So when we hear these er reported earnings numbers, I mean, how should investors sort of think about that? Yeah, I have one, one nice anecdote to give you. You know, if you take CompuStat or you take Capital IQ or you take Bloomberg and you look at the percentage of companies that report special items, do you know what it is? Yes, it's a lot higher than I would have guessed. Um, whatever number I say, it's probably going to be a lot higher than that. 90%. CompuStat, for example, 90% of the companies, they identify special items for them. Now, it used to be something like 60, 70%. Now it's something like 90%. So basically, every almost every, every company that you look at will have special items. Is this manipulation? No, this could be perfectly legitimate. But does it have implications for earnings, earnings sustainability? Definitely. Special item, by definition, is supposed to be special. So not something that you see again. Is it really special? Almost never. Because if you have restructuring, you're going to have restructuring in the future too. If you have impairment, you're going to have impairment in the future too. I actually have a study that shows it. You know? So these things are not transitory, but they are volatile. So you always have this volatile item in the income statement. Warren Buffett has a nice quote on, on this, on the fact that restructuring charges is not something that you want to ignore. You know, it's definitely irrelevant. And, and I have it in the earnings quality monograph if you, want, if you want to see. So, so the point is that you always need to worry about it. So I would not put any of the companies at a 10. I would always look at what has to be adjusted. What, have to, what, what do I have to consider here? In this? Now, some of them will be really, really issues, you know, that are manipulating the financial statements. How big is this proportion? Small. Most companies don't manipulate in an aggressive way. But having issues with earnings sustainability, always relevant. We've done a lot of podcasts and what this Pod, this discussion is, is sort of uh, making me think about is that you can find, an, I, I think at least, I mean, if you were really good at finding good quality earning, uh, er, good quality earnings companies, you could actually, I think, have an edge in the market. Um, like there are a lot of times, you know, it's hard to see where the edge might come from, but this is like a lot of work that would need to be done to truly adjust. And if you could get at that sustainability of earnings and find those companies 
that can sustain those earnings and then look to buy them, incorporate them in a value investing sort of framework, it does seem to me like you could have an edge here. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. And I think some of the people that come up with quality factors try to do that, you know. So basically trying to condition the value metric on the quality. So you bring them together, you know, in some way. But if you do it in a really structured way that is based on a good understanding of the accounting, it's much more likely to work. The, the thing is that, you know, most people don't really understand accounting. I've been working on this uh, annex quality monograph uh, for, since COVID started, basically. And it's like a 600-page monograph that is available, actually, for anyone to download on SSRN. The, my motivation there was based on 30 years of teaching accounting, of doing a lot of consulting, you know, on the buy side and on the sell side. And you have very smart people that have a very good understanding of the business. But, you know, when it comes to the accounting, they are missing a lot of the insights because they don't understand how this information is actually reflected in the financial statements. So, so I think that there's, you have to really understand the accounting. Whenever you use accounting information, you have to have a reasonable understanding of the accounting information. When you define, whenever you define a metric, even a value metric that uses accounting information, you need to think about all the quality issues that come along with it. And quality is not manipulation. Quality is not just manipulation. Quality most of the time is other things, like I mentioned before, that, that have implications for whether the earnings is sustainable or not. It actually makes me think of, um, we had Michael Mobison on the podcast, he was talking about this, and he was saying he teaches students, basically, you have to earn the right to use valuation multiples. You know, if, if you're going to use a valuation multiple, you need to know what it actually means. You know, and if you don't earn that right, you shouldn't be using it. I love this. That's exactly how I think about it. In the presentation, you talked about um, sort of reformulating financial statements and how you might think about that. So can you just explain that? So what do we mean by reformulating the financial statements? So we typically think about two buckets of activities. We think about operating and we think about financing. Now, we typically think about value being created in operations. Financing can have some effects, but still the creation of value is primarily in operations. We also know that when it comes to operating activities, the balance sheet doesn't give us the value of operations. We use historical cost accounting, property, plant, and equipment, maybe just a fraction of the value today because what we report on the balance sheet is the historical cost. We know that investments in intangibles in operations, we don't report them on the balance sheet, we expense them. We know that we have to write down assets when they are impaired. We don't, we're not allowed to write up assets when they go up in value. So when, when it comes to the value of operations, the balance sheet doesn't give us the value of operations for these three reasons. Historical cost accounting for operating assets, the fact that we don't uh, report investments in intangible assets on the balance sheet, we expense them, and the fact that we write down as investments when, when they're not successful, and we don't write them up when, when we make good investments. All these distortions make balance sheet not reflect the value of operations. But this is not the case for financing. For financing, the balance sheet pretty much tells you what is the value of the financing activities. The amount of debt on the balance sheet, the book value may, may be different from the fair value, but the difference is typically not very big. And when you make investments uh, in marketable securities, which is also a financing activity, it's essentially reducing the net borrowing. The balance sheet reports, reports the fair value of the investment. So the balance sheet gives us the value of the financing. The balance sheet does not give us the value of the operations. So how do we value a business? We value a business by separately valuing the operating and the financing. For the financing piece, we go to the balance sheet, basically. We make some adjustments, but it's pretty much the balance sheet. For the operations, we go to the income statement. We go to the cash flow statement. For the operations, we ask, what is the value of the business to generate operating profit? We typically take EBITDA and we apply a multiple to it. And we get an estimate for the value of operations. That's if we do relative valuation. If we do DCF, we think about the ability of operations to generate free cash flows in the future. We calculate the present value and we have an estimate for the value of the operations. So if we're using the balance sheet to estimate the value of financing, and we're using the income statement or the cash flow statement to estimate the value of operations, we have to be very careful. We have to be very careful because if we don't reformulate the financial statements properly, and by this I mean, if we don't differentiate between operating and financing activities in a correct and consistent way in the balance sheet and in the income statement, we're going to find ourselves double counting or ignoring, completely ignoring an item. Okay. And uh, 
let me give you an example. Think about cash. Cash, it seems like cash is a financing asset. You know, you can look at the balance sheet, you can see how much cash we have, easy to measure. So let's get, take the cash and net it against the debt and say this is the net effect of financing. If you're doing it, you're, you are immediately overstating the value of the company. Why? Because if you take all the cash away from the business, the business will not be able, able to operate. You need to have cash the same way that you need to have inventory to operate a business. So what you really want to do is you want to ask yourself how much cash is needed in order to generate EBITDA, and that's part of operations, and any excess amount of cash that we have that we can net against debt. Okay. So whenever you do valuation or whenever you're trying to evaluate how profitable the business is, how profitable are the operations, you need to be very careful to differentiate among operating and financing items on the balance sheet and in the income statement. But for the income statement, you don't end there. For the income statement, you also worry about what in the income statement is recurring in nature and what is transitory, which is very difficult to do, and we touched on it earlier on. Once you're in the income statement, so the way to, to do it is the following. If you go to the income statement, you take out, in the income statement, you take, you take out the transitory items, and you put them aside. So now you're left with recurring income. Now you ask how much of this recurring income is related to operations and how much is related to financing. And for the balance sheet too, you identify what on the balance sheet is related to operations and what is related to financing. And now you have the building blocks bought for valuation, as I just explained, and for the profitability analysis that we discussed before. Jack, I expect you to be rebuilding our financial statements based on uh, everything that the, the professor just said, <laughs> I, I didn't get the work right away. We spent most of our time <laughs> talking about the financial indicators of earnings quality, but can you just quickly talk about some of the non-financial things that you would look at? Yeah, so we have research over the last 10, 15 years that identify many, many, many indicators that are using information outside of the financial statements themselves that tell us quite a lot about uh, earnings quality, about the likelihood that earnings have been manipulated. So maybe a few examples. You know, think about companies that have high multiples. So think about industry where the average multiple is, uh, I don't know, 15. And now you have a company with a multiple of 30. Why? Because people are really excited about these companies. They're running growth, they're prospects. You know, maybe they have low risk. So they have a very high multiple. So now, if this company is going to disappoint, if the earnings are going to be below expectations, what will happen to the price of this company? two negative effects will come in. If earnings are going to, to disappoint, then investors now will see a lower earnings number. But it's not going to end there. If this is a high multiple company and investors are disappointed, they're probably also going to lower the multiple. So, and typically the reduction in the multiple will be the bigger effect. So now a company that has this characteristic of a very high multiple is a company that is very sensitive to not disappointing. So what does it translate to? It translates to these guys are more likely to manipulate earnings when earnings are going to be below expectations. So just looking at the value multiple tells you something about the likelihood of earnings manipulation. Okay. So this is one example. We have a lot of research, for example, from surveys. We have, a, we have a, several surveys of buy-side analysts, sell-side analysts, uh, uh, CFOs, and others that when, when they are asked, what would be a red flag for you for the financial statements being manipulated, many times their number one red flag is actually the strength of the corporate governance. Weak corporate governance, they will say, is for me a big red flag. Or if the company has internal control issues, which companies are requ required to report on since Sarbanes Oxley, that's a big red flag for me too. So that's another indication. Events that happen, you know, many, many things. In, in my Onyx quote in monograph, I have, a, I think, something like 100 pages of single line, you know, where I go through hundreds of different indicators based on lots of research in finance and accounting and even other fields that basically identify, you know, what are the circumstances in which earnings are less likely to be sustainable. So let, let me actually give another example, which is more recent now, very relevant these days, inflation. What are the effects of inflation on the financial statements? Think about, think about what is going on. So you have the income statement. It starts with revenue, and then you have the different expenses. Inflation goes up. What is inflation? Inflation is the price of products. Who sells product? Companies. 
So inflation going up means revenue going up. Nominal revenue going up immediately at the same time. That's how we measure inflation. What about the expenses? Labor costs go up? Yes, maybe slight delay, but they go up too. Raw material go up? Yes, maybe slight delay, but they go up too. At least the way that we expense them. What about depreciation? What we, are, what we are depreciating are the assets that we bought in the past. It will take a lot of time. It will take a lot of time for the inflation to show up in depreciation. So how the different line items adjust to inflation is not the same time. So in fact, when, when, when uh, inflation goes up, for many companies, especially for capital-intensive companies, earnings can go up a lot. Real earnings can go up. Reported real earnings can go up. But then as inflation catch up on the depreciation line, so whether the earnings are sustainable or not, at times of high inflation, it's not just about whether the company has the power to, to, you know, to, to move the cost to the customer. It's also about this uh, historical, the fact that how we measure the different expenses and the type of expenses that companies have affects what will happen to earnings going forward. So this is another example of a factor that you want to take into account. Inflation, foreign exchange effects are very relevant too. You know, what happens with foreign exchange for global companies, the effects can be very, very significant on whether earnings are sustainable or not. Companies actually generally cannot edge the top line revenue. They can edge earnings, but not the top line in terms of how the accounting works. So how you evaluate what will happen to revenue in the future when there is a lot of fluctuation in exchange rates, even if the company hedged, it's not trivial. You can still have volatility in reported revenue. Do you think earnings quality could ever be quantified or modeled out or is it something that a human will always have to do or maybe could you get like maybe 80 percent of the way there with a, a quantitative model what are your thoughts on that so in my earnings quality monograph in the chapter two i go through this comprehensive indicator so there are some comprehensive indicators that you want to look at each one of them has advantage disadvantages you always want to look at a set of them so one of them will be as i mentioned earlier on you want to ask yourself how much of the earnings is cash earnings versus accruals. If you ask CFOs or sell-side analysts, in terms of ratios what, or in terms of financial analysis, what is the number one analysis to conduct to evaluate earnings quality? This will be the first answer. We have several surveys that show them. You, but, but you basically what you do, if you do it at the company level, you basically want to plot how earnings behave over time and how cash from operations behave over time. So if you see that earnings are growing, but cash from operation is not growing at the same rate, big red flag. If you do it in the context of a universe of companies, you want to look at measures such as the one that uh, Richard Sloan, that you probably know, developed uh, accruals relative to total assets, average total assets, or other measures. So that's one, one thing that you want to do. Earnings, how much of it is accruals, how much of it is cash flow. Another thing that you want to do, which accountants will tell you, and there is quite a lot of research in accounting and some in finance, that actually tells you if you want to evaluate earnings quality, maybe an even better way of doing it is comparing and what, how much assets we have on the balance sheet with revenue. So if assets on the balance sheet are growing at a faster rate than revenue, big red flag. Another thing that they will tell you, look at discretionary expenses like R&D, advertising, sg &A in general, because it has discretionary expenditures in it. And if as a percentage it declines, it's a red flag that maybe the company, not a red flag for manipulation, but maybe they're cutting advertising, maybe they're cutting hiring. Maybe they're doing less R&D. You know, this will have negative implications for the future. So that's a third ratio that you want to use. Then you want to look at how, how, how aggressive is the company in terms of identifying special items. So a company that has a lot of restructuring charges, a lot of impairment, a lot of things like that, that tells you that what they call core earnings is manipulated, is overstated. So there are these type of indicators that you can look at, and you can basically summarize the insight into one composite measure. And that will tell you quite a lot. So I tell my students, I teach a class on earnings quality. I tell them, you know, if you want the minimum minimum to take for my class, at least these five, six indicators you always want to consider. But then I say, I hope, I hope you, you learn more than this in my class because we, went, we dive deep into line item analysis. We looked at other indicators. Many of them you can quantify. I, I did some con consulting engagement, you know, coming up with an, a composite that reflects many insight for many, many different financial indicators and also non-financial indicators. One of the projects that I did, it was an Excel. This was like 15 years ago or so, so quite some time back, was to build a big Excel uh, you know, spreadsheet that went through something like 200 questions. Most of them were answered through Bloomberg data, you know, and then basically give you like a composite index. 
Is it perfect? It's far from perfect, but it gives you much more than what a single indicator will give you. Now, if you do it in a cont contextual analysis, it can be even better. And I think that the way to think about annex quality is not man, not machine. It's man plus machine. And that's the best combination, I think. So we like to ask all of our guests a standard closing question. And that is, if you could teach your average investor one lesson based on your research and experience, what would that be? Okay. So I think we touched on some of the things. So don't use accounting information without first evaluating the quality of the information. Also, consider accounting and other measurement issues, and we touched on this, whenever you de define or use factors. So that's another, another thing. And now to my business, tech accounting classes, maybe even executive education programs. I run several programs at Columbia, and they're doing very well. I run a program where I have a lot of you know, CFOs, portfolio managers. The last iteration, I had 56 participants. So people find it quite... <laughs> But I, and, I, and I go into these earnings quality uh, topics. And then I'm still talking about what I do. My earnings quality monograph, which is a very, very comprehensive document, and I'm still work in process. But that's basically what I want to leave as my legacy in this business, which is basically have a very comprehensive uh, analysis and one source for earnings quality. And again, it's free. It's available free on SSRN for anyone to download. And we will absolutely be putting a link to that in the show notes and uh, promoting that when we can, because um, this has been great. This has been very valuable. I mean, we're kind of taking, like you said, 600 pages and trying to condense it down into an hour conversation. But I think our audience and investors for a long time will be learning a lot from this episode. So thank you very much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Excess Returns. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at @practicalquant and follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carboneau. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube or leave a review or a comment. We appreciate it.